event, one fall, 15 minute time limit. Introducing first, in this corner, from Belton, South Carolina, at 231 pounds, Tommy Siegler. Well, I, I grew up in Anderson starting when I started in the first grade. And my daddy had worked in construction, and until I got re old enough to start school, we just moved all over the South. I lived in five or six different states, and once I got old enough to start the school, he decided to quit moving me around, and, and he moved us here to Anderson, and I went to school here in Anderson through the eighth grade. And after that, uh, we moved down to Iowa, where my daddy was originally from. And I went, finished high school down there, the last class at Iowa High School in 1956. The following year is when Crescent High School opened. Now, were, did you, were you a, did you like to fight? Were you a wrestler? <laughs> did you? Well, there was no wrestling at, at any schools back in those days here, no wrestling. I like to get out in the yard and try to wrestle with somebody, <laughs> if I could get somebody to do that, yeah. Right. Okay, so you finished school and you went to college where? I didn't go to college, I went to work right after high school, I went to work, and uh, I worked the first year up in Flint, Michigan with General Motors, and then I came back down here and went to work with Daniel Construction Company, and they trained me to be an engineer, and I worked with them several years before I started wrestling full-time. Well, now, let's talk about how you moved from being an engineer to being a wrestler. How, how did that, uh, that happen? Well, during the time I was working with Daniel Construction Company, I, I was working on one of their jobs down in Pensacola, Florida, and I started working out at the YMCA down there, just working out with weights, and uh, I met some guys that were wrestled part-time, and they got me to start wrestling with them part-time around that area. And uh, some of the full-time wrestlers that would come to Pensacola once a week, they would come there, and sometimes they would come by the Y during the day to just to work out a little bit, and, and I got to know some of them, but they wouldn't wrestle with me during the day there because they couldn't take a chance on getting hurt and not being able to wrestle that night. But they they knew me and we got to be friends and after a few years of me just wrestling part-time, some of them talked to me and uh, told me I should go do it full-time. So after a few years I did, I gave up my job with Daniel Construction and started wrestling full-time. Now back then not a lot of people were lifting weights. You can see that more now. What got you interested in lifting weights? I don't know why, what got me so interested, but uh, like I did, when I, when I first started lifting weights around this area, I think there was only two other guys in Anderson County that I knew that lifted weights, and there were no gyms in any place like that to do it. If you lifted weights, you had to have them in, in your yard or in, in your house and do it. But I just, uh, I always thought I wanted to do that, and I, I didn't get started lifting weights till I was about 18 or 19. Did you play other sports? Well, I played... Uh, Football, basketball, and baseball in high school. But nobody was lifting weights back then. No, for high school. So. Right. Not even, not even college. No, none of the Clemson football players were lifting weights back in the fifties. <laughs> okay, so you were an engineer, and you went from being a part-time wrestler. You decided you wanted to do that full-time. Uh, what, what was the first time you remember wrestling when you became a professional full-time? Well, I, I went down to. Pensacola, because I had worked there several times, several years during my work in construction, so I decided I would go down there to start wrestling full time in that area around uh, Mobile, Alabama, and Pensacola, and Tallahassee and stuff. And uh, I wrestled for four weeks there, and and I realized I wasn't making quite as much money as I thought I might, so I decided I would maybe go back and try some some more work with construction, and the construction company said, well, we'll send you down to Puerto Rico for a while. We got a job there we need you at. So I talked to a promoter in uh, Tampa, Florida, that had already told me he promoted wrestling in, in Puerto Rico. So I talked to him, and he said, well, if you're going down there, we'll, we'll let you wrestle all the time in Puerto Rico, and we won't have to fly somebody down there as much. So I went down to Puerto Rico, and I wrestled there for six or seven months I stayed there and after that time was up I was, uh, I was ready to go back and start it full time again and I did. So uh, After that I gave up my construction completely for several years, just wrestled full time. Now when was that roughly? Uh, what? That was 69 when I started and I wrestled until 
uh, December of 77 when I had a serious injury that ended my career. Okay, I want to get to that in a minute. Wrestling was a lot different when you started in 69. People think about wrestling today as sort of a, a circus, but back then it was more, it, it looked more like almost like Olympic wrestling in some ways than it did the show stuff. Oh, much, much different then. And back then most people had used their real name. Um, I always wrestled by my real name all over the world. And uh, most people did use a real name or a name that sounded real. They didn't use any kind of uh, name that sounded like a cartoon character or anything like that, any, like they do now. So. Do, you, do you have certain matches you remember best? Do you have like favorites or things that, that, that strike you and that you still remember today? Well, there's one match that uh, a lot of people still remember. It was a, a match against Dick Steinborn in Atlanta. And that was in 73. And I have talked to so many wrestlers since then, and they tell me that they were trained by that match. They said when they went to a wrestling camp to be trained, the trainer would show them that match, that particular match, and said, this is what you need to learn how to do. And I d I'll always remember that match. And I had several others. Uh, I wrestled uh, uh, several different people. I wrestled several world champions, and I know one time I I uh, wrestled a world champion in, out in Los Angeles, but it was a non-title match, and I beat him that time, and he, he was surprised, so I got scheduled for another t title match against him later on, several months later. But I, my injury ended my career before I got to that match. So how, how many, uh, do you know how many matches you had before you finished? No, I had over 2,000. That, people need, can't even comprehend that in any sport now. No, I know. You were wrestling, what, how many nights a week? We'd, we wrestled six nights a week. We never wrestled on Sunday back then. But we wrestled six nights. If you, if you weren't injured, you wrestled six nights. If you got injured, you may have to take a week or two off. But, uh, yeah, but you, it was a full-time thing. And you had some titles. You won some titles. I did, yes. What were some had, of your titles? Well, I was a, a, had a Florida title, a, a title in Georgia. Um, I was, the, my best title, I guess it would be, I was British Commonwealth heavyweight champion at one time. And also in 1977, I was picked as International Wrestler of the Year. So I, and I had, I had several smaller titles before that, so. That's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Now, you wrestled, you just mentioned the British Commonwealth and International, you wrestled all over the world. I did. What was it like wrestling in other countries? Well, sometimes you'd wrestle, be wrestling somebody that didn't speak English and you didn't speak Chinese or their language too, so <laughs> it was a different thing altogether. But uh, I enjoyed being in, I spent several months in Australia and several months in uh, New Zealand. Those two places I really liked. And uh, I could understand, I would, if I had to live there full time, I'd still enjoy those places. But I wrestled in some others too. Uh, but you know, it's just wrestling all over the United States. It takes a good bit of your time and good education. I I lived up in Canada and wrestled up there for several months too. Now y'all traveled around in groups? No, not always. Not no. Always. This, nowadays, I think they go in groups and go somewhere and wrestle for a two to, a couple of days, and then the group goes somewhere else. But. Back then, uh, I always went separately. And now, did you get on a train or a bus or a plane, or how did you get from match to match? I drove, and then once, once, occasionally I might get on a plane, but back in those days, usually you'd drive about 2,000 miles a week. And you were, for how long were you fighting six nights a week? Well, that was for about eight or nine years. <laughs> wow. And so, in 1977, you were wrestling and you got injured. Tell me, what was that match, what was going on in that match, and how did you get hurt? The match was in uh, in Singapore, and it was a tag match. And my partner, I saw him get out of the ring one time. I didn't know. I thought maybe he was just getting down on the floor or something. And I so I stayed in the ring. Was wrestling against one of the opponents, and and I kept looking around and didn't see my partner. I didn't know where he went. And finally, the the other guy, the other guy on that team, he came in, and both of them just jumped all over me and. And uh, finally, they got me pretty well injured, and and I noticed the the, the crowd, the, the, the fans there, got real upset. They were up right close to the ring, arguing, and, and they could tell they were fixing to come up in the ring to get try to save me. 
And about that time, uh, probably 25 or 30 police officers came running in there with helmets on and a shield and a stick like that, getting the crowd back. And they took the, my two opponents out of the ring, took them back to their dressing room. But uh, I never was able to get to get well after that. What I, happened? What? They, they injured my back. They kept jumping on my back. And, uh, and when I got back to the hotel and I could hardly, couldn't stand up and walk much. And I asked the promoter to get me a chiropractor. And he said, we don't have chiropractors at all in Singapore. He said, well, I can put you in the hospital and let them go ahead and do some surgery. And I said, well, no, I don't want to do that. I'd rather go home and have my surgery. And it was in about two weeks before Christmas. And I already had a ticket to get me back. But it was about 10 days before the ticket was scheduled. And I, I talked to the airlines and they said, well, we can fly you from Singapore to Hong Kong, but there's no empty seats from Hong Kong onto the United States till that ticket you already got. So I said, if you come to Hong Kong, you're gonna have to wait here 10 days. So I ended up just spending 10 more days and then laying in a, the hotel there in Singapore before I left. But once I got home, uh, when I left, when I left Singapore, they raised some seat uh, armrests up and let me lay down on one row of seats all the way to Hong Kong. From Hong Kong on into the United States, they didn't have any empty seats. So once we got up where they could let me undo the seat belt, they fixed me a place to lay in the aisle. <laughs> and it was a flight at night and people walking them down the aisle almost tripping over me. <laughs> they didn't know what was wrong with me, but I had to lay on the floor. But once I got into Atlanta later at the end of that flight, uh, I went to a chiropractor in Atlanta and he worked on me, it was about midnight, and he worked on me and got me in a feeling a whole lot better. So the next morning I drove on back to Belton and went to my chiropractor there that I'd always gone to and he said, you've got some damage here that chiropractor is not going to fix. And so he made some arrangements for me to go over to, back to Atlanta and I went over to the Atlanta Falcon doctors. They checked me and said, well, we, can, we need to go in there and fuse one of those joints in your back and you can take 12 months off and let it heal and then you can go back to wrestling if you want to. So I said, okay, well, we schedule that and I was there in the hospital, so he, they came and took me back and did some kind of test the night before the surgery was scheduled. And about midnight that night, he and the doctor and the nurse came in into my room, woke me up, said, we need to talk to you before we have that surgery in the morning. Said, that test we did a while ago shows there's a lot more damage in your back than we thought. Said, instead of having one bad joint, you got three. And I said, well, you're gonna fuse three joints? They said, no, we can't do that because if we fuse that many, then you're gonna have a long, stiff place in your back. And every time you move or bend, said the, the disc above it and below it's gonna take extra pressure and then they're gonna go bad right away. So I said, well, there's nothing we can do about fixing that. I said, if you want us to, we'll go in there and try to trim the disc away from the nerves and get some of the pain gone, but there's no way we can fix it up. So I said, well, let's do that. Well, since I'm already here, let's see if we can get the pressure off the nerves. And we did that, but uh, they couldn't fix it, so I knew I never could wrestle again after that. So it was 1978 and your wrestling career was over? In 1978, right. And uh, how old were you then? Well, I was about 39, yeah. So what did you decide you were going to do? I mean, what were you going to do? Well, I went back to construction. Back as work. back? Well, I was working as an engineer. That's right. That's yeah. An engineer, yeah. Yeah. In fact, uh, there was a couple of lawyers wanted to put me on disability, and I said, I don't know if I want to do that. And uh, they said, well, you can't wrestle. What else do you do? I said, well, I was a construction engineer. And they said, well, do you ever have to climb or lift or anything? I said, well, sometime, sometime I might climb up on top of a boiler, see if the piping's put in like it should have been. And they said, well, we don't want you climbing, so we're going to go ahead and put you on disability. And I said, no, 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 don't do that. But I did. I went to work. and. Worked several more years in construction, but I did working in an office most of that time. All right, so you finished that, and how did you get from there to working for Anderson County? Well, after I worked several more years in construction, I decided I wanted to try something different altogether, so that's when I went into security work. 
I went to work for uh, one of the largest security companies in the nation in Atlanta. They had about 4,000 employees and they trained me, put me in charge of security at the Equitable Building in downtown Atlanta. If you know much about Atlanta, it's, it's 100 Peachtree Street right down the heart of Atlanta and when it was built in 1960, it was the tallest building in Atlanta. But they put me in charge of security there and there was about about 3,000 people worked in that building. And I had a, a crew that worked for me and we had to have security in that building 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And I stayed over there for two years doing that and then I decided I was ready to come back home. I, one of my, do my do daughter that was getting ready to go into high school then told me she needed me to come back here more than just on weekends. And so I told the company that I was working for that I was going to have to leave and they said, well, we got an office in Greenville. I said, Look, why don't we just put you in the Greenville office? So I did that. I worked there for them uh, three or four years in Greenville doing security with that same company and finally when I just, they asked me if they would close that Greenville office, would I want to go back to Atlanta? And I said, no, I don't. So I left them and I started doing security work here at the Civic Center and working for the county. So I've been been doing that now for a long, long and time. And so now your title is what? You're, you're, I know you're in charge of security at the historic courthouse. That's right. And you've been doing this how long now here? No, I've been in this building here for about 15 years. Wow. You may have been here longer than anybody else. <laughs> one of the longest ones, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I enjoy this. I'm, I'm here five days a week. and. So I'm, I'm here late at night if they're having a, any kind of meeting. I'm here till everybody leaves the building and I check it all and lock it up. But I enjoy security work. Well, and this, this historic courthouse and the folks who work here seem to have almost a family-like closeness a lot of times. You see, I, hear, I see y'all talking a lot and I see people, they all seem to know each other really well. Well, we do, that's right. And uh, when there's only 50 or 60 people in your building, you soon get to know all, every one of them and you get to know their family and their relatives and family come to meet and see them sometime in the building so you get to know everybody now your health is okay now you're, you're back to lifting weights right you're still oh yes now? yes i lift weights i just I can't lift anything that will injure my uh, my back that part right but i, I can lift uh, lighter weights and then hit more reps and i still like to lift weights every day almost almost every day so I got a, I got a gym in the basement of my home. I got four thousand pounds of weights in that basement. So I can lift anything I want to without having to change it much. Just go pick up another one. And so your back feeling okay? For it's okay as long as I don't, as long as I don't have an accident of any kind uh, to aggravate it. Uh, it's all right. I, I can get by with very little pain now. Well, I've got to ask one question. Having watched wrestling while you were wrestling, that was um, how much of it was scripted? Uh, you'd have to talk to somebody else because it wasn't mine wasn't your day no. I was looking at some and I'll have some of the videos uh, as part of this video of you wrestling it doesn't it doesn't resemble anything like wrestling now it, it looked like I said it looked more almost particularly when y'all started off almost like Olympic style wrestling y'all were looking for grappling and it didn't look like so so when you went in the ring you didn't know what was gonna happen no I didn't know no. so and usually if it was a, a gonna be a large wrestling match a group of matches uh, somewhere in a big town with a lot of people they would always ask me to come and wrestle and they'd put me against somebody that wrestled like I did so we'd have a good wrestling match that night and and they, they knew that neither one of us was going to be out there trying to uh, trying to injure each other uh, fatally or anything like that or but they well, they wanted us to wrestle and most of us back in those days did wrestle. And it was huge, community to community people. Oh yeah. Fighting Anderson, did you ever wrestle here? Yes, back in those days, uh, Anderson had wrestling every three weeks. The rec center. At the rec center on a Thursday every three weeks and I was there several times. I spent about, uh, I'll say after all those years I wrestled, I spent about three of those years in the mid-Atlantic area with both Carolinas and Virginia. And so I would be in Anderson. That was televised a lot, mid-Atlantic. Oh wrestling. yes, yes it was. Yes, but I would, I would uh, be wrestling anywhere in either Charlotte, Greenville, Spartanburg, Charleston, Norfolk, Richmond, all those kind of places. Asheville, I'd, I'd be driving about two thousand miles a week from one place to the other. Had all Sundays off though. <laughs> that does not sound glamorous. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. I had to sp spend several hours a day driving and then wrestle fifteen or twenty minutes <laughs> when I got there. What, 
Uh, do you have any opinion at all about wrestling today, what it's become? be honest with you, I don't watch it much anymore. Uh, it's not in it. It's not what I like. The, the, what I'm seeing in it nowadays is not what I like. So I don't watch it much anymore. Uh, there's maybe one or two guys around that I knew and still think a lot of. And uh, if I know they're going to be on TV, I might watch their match. But normally I don't watch it enough to even know who's on that night. So, so you're still in touch with some, some of the people a little? Or you just kind of well, they are? You just remember? we have a reunion first weekend in March every year down in Mobile and it's for the guys that have retired and when I first started going down there back in 03 there was over 200 of people there and his fans don't come it's all people that are, were wrestlers or their their family and there were quite a few of the older guys my age and uh, we always spoke to each other and some of the time we were not close f friends at that time but uh, after we retired we became friends and but now so many of them have passed away, uh, I still go down there, but there's fewer of the older time wrestlers that I'm, that I'm one of. But um, I enjoy seeing the ones that are there. Uh, Ron, Ronnie Garvin is always there, and uh, quite a few others that used to come and they're just not, not there anymore. In your years here at the courthouse, have you ever had to wrestle anybody? You ever had to grab no, anybody? Or no, not really. I, I've, been, I've been prepared to a few times. <laughs> I thought if, if it's what it's going to take, I was going to do it. I was going to put a hold on them, but <laughs> hadn't gone that far yet. <laughs> so that's why you still live late. Yes. <laughs> and so you still enjoy what working here? Plan on staying a while? I'll probably stay a few more years, yeah, uh, if they want me to. Uh, I've told them several years ago, if they need me to leave, let me know, and I'll, I'll be glad to get out of the way for them, but uh, they, they act like they want me to stay a little bit longer. I don't know if they feel sorry for me and just trying to help me out, but, uh, but uh, if they want me to stay, I will. If they want me to leave, I will. Well, I think it's two things. I think one, you're popular. Everybody here likes you that I've talked to. And the second one, I know some of them are still afraid of you, so they... <laughs> 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 Mr. Siegler, I appreciate it. I hope people enjoy this story. I know people love to hear stories about what people are doing, and uh, I think people are going to enjoy this. Well, I hope so. Okay. Thank you for giving me a chance. Thanks.